Hi, welcome to the Sigma Pad. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is a Fluke 5450A, which is a precision instrument for resistor standards. It has a whole bunch of resistors inside with very high precision and a bunch of relays that can switch in and out various combinations. And it's all compensated for and so on. We'll take a look inside of it. Ilya from XDev actually recommended that I get one of these, so I have to blame him. For the cost of this, I put this on eBay list, watch list a long time ago, and eventually one of them showed up and I bought this completely as is, and it doesn't work, of course. So we're going to figure out what's wrong with it, and hopefully we can bring it up to life and add it and try it against my 8.5-digit multimeter and see how well it performs. So it's already plugged in. I can turn it on, and when I turn it on, this is what happens. It's just this light turns on, and it does absolutely nothing. Now, even though it's in remote, none of these buttons do anything. I tried the GPIB. There's no life. I think something more fundamentally is wrong with it. Now, one thing I forgot to mention was that the unit was absolutely filthy. I spent at least 30 minutes just cleaning it. It looked like it was in storage and had a lot of dust and oil and other things all around it. But uh, hopefully on the inside, it looks better. All right, so here's the inside on the digital part, and it looks really nice and clean, which is great, which means that whatever was outside of the unit is probably how it was stored. It might have broken many years ago, and it's just been sitting in storage. And there's a cover on the other side where all the relay configurations are also printed on it, which is great. The full schematic of this is available, so if you ever need it, we can jump to that. Now, all the UV erasable EEPROMs do not have their covers. And I looked around inside the unit, and the label had peeled off and fallen off. So I'm going to put something on here. It's good to put something to protect these because all the UV radiation that may be just around can actually damage the individual bits that are in there and it can cause corruptions and so on. So I'll cover those. But the rest of it looks pretty good. We will have our main processor over here. We have some SRAMs and some other flash memory in here as well, probably for calibration. And then we have this chip, which I think is another microprocessor handling the GPIB. Power supply under over here. So far, I think the light turns on, so there must be some life in the power supply. So we're going to have to start with that measurement. All right, some basic power supply measurements. So I covered these with copper tape, which is pretty much the best thing for blocking any kind of UV getting in there. So where is our VSS? I think this is our VSS. Should we turn it on? There's a little LED on the board that does turn on, which is a good sign. And there you go. That's actually pretty good. 5.09, so it's 5 volt supply. Seems to be alive. Let's measure some of these capacitors to make sure that voltage does get in to these, all these decoupling capacitors. There you go, 5 volts there, makes sense. 5 there is good. Do these chips have 5 volts? Yep, they do. Looks good. Yeah, that's pretty good. So I think the 5 volt is indeed there. So everything is there. Now we should look for some activity because I think there is nothing happening. So we should look at this digital activity on here. There should be a lot of communication happening at least on startup between the processor and all these different chips that are around there. One of the nice things about these dip packages and everything being so large is that catching these digital activities is really easy with an oscilloscope. So let's go ahead and use the Rodenshaw's RTB2004 to monitor some of these waveforms. Now this is a 1 volt per division signal over here, and we have a 10x probe. So let's measure the power supply, and what do we have? There you go, it jumps to 5 volts, as we saw, of course, with the multimeter. Now there is a pin here for the clock of the microprocessor, which is supposed to be 4 megahertz. And here it is, and it is a 5 volt peak to peak signal, and indeed it is at exactly 4 megahertz. So the crystal, the frequency generation, all that stuff is actually working on this, which is interesting. So that's not the issue, that typically could be because this thing has some active frequency generation. And the clock's going into, this is the clock going into the microprocessor for the GPIB port, that's supposed to be 1 megahertz, and it is in fact 1 megahertz. So even the dividers are working. So that's not a problem. Now we can go ahead and take a look at some of the pins of the microprocessor, see if there is any activity, like one of these address pins. And no, there isn't. You can see it's just sitting high on the other side, and same thing. It's just sitting high. So all of these pins are actually just sitting high, and there it is. But you know what? I just realized that it's not really sitting high. It's sitting at about 3.8 or 3.9 volts, as opposed to the 5 volt supply that it is receiving, like this. There it is. Yeah, so that's something is not right. And it is a little warm, and these chips are also a little bit warm. That's not a good thing. Something's going on. I think there's some bus contention, and that's generally not a good sign. Now, it could be that either these are dead or the microprocessor is dead. Something is fighting each other. Now, because every single one of these is doing the same thing and some of those pins are not in parallel, I would suspect that maybe the processor is the problem. That's what is causing the issue. So we can try it again. I'm going to remove this and power it back on and see if these voltages recover. Okay, so the microprocessor is gone and I am going to measure the same pin 
it used to read 3.8 now it reads 0 so indeed this was what was fighting it so that's there's something going on there now you can't see the front of the instrument but the instrument is doing exactly the same thing as it was before it has that one LED on which means that even without the processor it's the same thing further telling me that this is not doing anything at all let's try changing the processor well it's a few days later I actually didn't have one of those processors but I did find one on eBay so we're gonna try that and see if this makes any difference at all all right let's try it out and aha that is beautiful look at that it actually did boot up so the processor was definitely the problem we can measure those voltages again I'm pretty sure they're now either 0 or 5 as they're supposed to be and here's the old one that is dead put my finger in here don't feel a lot of heat anymore they seem to be running a bit colder that's pretty good that's awesome let's take a look further and see what it does so even though the instrument boots up and now responds to the keys I couldn't hear any of the relays clicking so I opened this back side so we can take a look at it and look how beautiful and clean it is full of precision resistors some of them are 0.05 percent they're all fluke branded these are really hard to get I think they might be oil filled I'm not hundred percent sure but they're certainly designed for this kind of instrumentation and the reason we don't hear any activity on this side is because well both of these fuses are dead in fact, this is the reason why there's no power supply on this side of the board. These two fuses are in line with two diodes and there's an AC line coming in that goes through both of them. So they're both dead at the same time, which means both the forward and return current have been active at the same time, causing that both of them to blow. There's a few reasons why that could happen. It could be that there's a short circuit in this capacitor, it could be a short circuit in the diodes, or it could have just been a surge event. And that surge event perhaps could have also knocked out the processor and that's why it wasn't working. Now, instead of just replacing the switches, I think a couple of things we can do. First of all, make sure that this guy is not short-circuited and those diodes are not short-circuited. We can also bring it up slowly with the isolation transformer. Let's quickly make sure we don't have a short circuit here across this capacitor. And it's counting up, which is good. So the capacitor is charging and we don't seem to have at least a short circuit. This should continue to go on until very, very high values. It doesn't mean that the capacitor is healthy, but at least it means there is no short circuit. I might still change that if I have a replacement because it's a really old capacitor. All right, I used the isolation transformer and I slowly brought up the power supply. And indeed, we do get a nice 12 volt. This is the unregulated side, I think. And there's a 5 volt regulator, which regulates it to where it should be. The capacitor did test okay. So now we should be able to switch the ranges and see something happen. Let's see? All right, look at that. I don't know if you can see it. But there are different relays that are reacting. It's really mesmerizing. Pretty cool. So as I mentioned earlier, the fundamental principle operation of an instrument like this is really quite straightforward. You have a bunch of resistors. This is the layout or the component placement of the analog board that is in the service manual. And these resistors are all wire bound, oil filled, I believe, you know, very high precision, very good stability over time and temperature and so on. And there is a bunch of hermetically sealed relays that allow you to connect and disconnect them. So this is what the schematic is. These are all of our precision resistors right over here can see them all in different values and combinations and a whole bunch of relays at the very top and they have to switch in various combinations to put them in parallel and series and so on in order to get the values that you want so the art is in really how you put it together how you make those resistors that's why really that's the essentially the value of that instrument is in those precision components and these are the drivers for the relays you can see all the coils of the relays are represented here by these inductors and there's a bunch of drivers that drives them really nothing unusual shift registers shift in data and then they become parallel and then they drive the relays and this is the digital board that you were looking at that's the really big capacitor that was right there in the middle and this was the bad processor and here are where the EEPROM uh, UV erasable EEPROMs were there and a bunch of other components this is what controls the GPIB, I believe, and this was not populated on my unit. Must be some option that it doesn't have, and is the HPIB port in the back. Schematic, pretty straightforward. We don't have to really go through them, but I think the voltages that I was measuring here wasn't particularly or necessarily the problem, as there are various pull-ups and pull-downs. It was more the fact that there were no activities, and no activity at all. Even though we had the clock coming in, and I believe this is the port I was measuring, that's where I saw the 4 megahertz clock, and that meant that this entire section with the flip-flops and the dividers and so on was also functional so when you see absolutely nothing coming out of these ports then the processor is most likely not doing anything and that's why removing and replacing it indeed did solve the problem and these are the EEPROMs that the processor interacts with and this is I believe not populated yeah it says not installed and over here this is the HPIB interface 
nothing unusual. We don't have to really go through all of that. This is a display, which is multiplexed, of course, and it also is controlled again by the processor. So when the processor wasn't working, you were getting nothing at all on the display, as to be expected, as everything is controlled by that main core processor. So I'm really eager to do some measurements on it. Let's go take it up. All right, here we go. I found a new home for the instrument in the lab. It's sitting at the top here, and at the very bottom we have the Keysight 3458A, which is 8.5 digit meter. We can use that as our measurement. Now, this hasn't been calibrated about 12, 2 years itself, but it should be good enough for our purposes. So with a short, which is registering here at 0, we're measuring about 0 0.00002 or 3 ohms. It changes a little bit here and there. These cables aren't ideal for this, but they're okay for the kind of measurements. I just want to make sure that it is roughly where it should be. I have to talk with Ilya from XDEV on calibrating it and worry about that later. So let's try 1 ohm. Okay. There's 1 ohm. So the number that you're reading here is not, of course, being measured by the Fluke. This is what's been calibrated and put inside of the instrument, it's firmware, so that you can read it out and what you should be actually expecting. If you look at the bottom, it's saying that it should be 0 0.999766, we're measuring 0 0.99967. So it's actually not that far off. So 1 ohm resistor is pretty close. I'm quite happy about that. Let's try the 10 ohm now. So yeah, that we're expecting 10.00, and then this is on a 50 a number of uh, power cycles it's running. So 10.001, pretty close, I would say. 1,000, uh, sorry, 100 ohms. Takes a little bit of time. There we go, not too bad. It again, it is pretty close. 1K, that 1K, when this was calibrated, that's really, really close, spot on. And this one, you can see it's certainly close also, but it's still missing some parts. But overall, that resistor is indeed working. Can 10 kilo ohm should also be OK. And there it is. Very good. This is exciting. I mean, this, I don't know when the last time this was calibrated is, but it's got to be a very long time ago, given the, the shape, the case of this was. It must be in storage for a long time. Very impressive how well it actually maintains its calibration status. It's 100K. Let's see what it does. Takes a bit of time for the 3458A because it needs to switch ranges. 100.005, 100.003. Definitely needs to be adjusted a little bit, but it's actually quite simple because you put it into calibration, you read this from a meter you can trust, and then you transfer that to this. That's really all you're doing because you can't change the value of those resistors that are inside. 100K, that's one meg. The one meg was also pretty close at the time when it was calibrated. Oh, it is also really close here. Look at that. There's four zeros, six, seven, five, four, nine at the end. Very, very impressive. Now, at one, one meg ohm, I'm not using any guard. So if I touch this around and just jiggle this, you see that you know, the value is going to jump around. So it's not the greatest measurement, but it's going to be good enough for us. And it's 10 meg. 10 meg was also pretty close at the time when it was calibrated. It's still pretty close now. Let's see, it switched back. Well, interesting, it went up and then back down. That does worry me a little bit, but it's still pretty close. And finally, 100. Let's see what that does. And then the 100 range, let's wait for it to settle. 100.015 is what it should be. 100.027 is what it is. I still think it's pretty good. Again, remember, this is a long time, and these cables are not very good cables for the 10, uh, 100 meg for sure. But overall, I'm pretty impressed. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this Pooch approved repair. He was very helpful during the measurement of the instrument. And by the way, I did find out what was the issue with the 10 megaohm resistor. It actually has to do with the ranging of the 3458A. If I change the range, I can get it to show a slightly different value. I have to take a look at the documentation to see if that is normal. But as always, let me know what you think in the comment section. I have a couple of other repairs ongoing and some reviews. And when I have the time, I'll be sure to post it. See you next time.